Introduction to Data Communications. Uh, so this chapter outlined brief history of data communications, communications, uh, uh, data communication networks. So we'll talk a little bit about that. Network models. Network models is what really allows us to it allows us to more easily build applications for one. It allows us to more easily talk about uh, different aspects of networking um, in a common language. It allows us to develop standards and, and things like that. So we'll talk about some of the, the, the common network models. We'll talk a little bit about one that's not included in the text. Uh, we'll talk about the importance of network standards. Basically, this doesn't work without standards. And then we'll kind of finish up talking uh, about a few of the future trends. So the first industrial revolution, um, introduction of machinery, new organizational methods, we basically had the opportunity to uh, change how our businesses were functioning. We had the, the introduction of things like uh, the telegraph, we had the introduction of, of, of uh, uh, the assembly line, things like that. And it allowed us to change how our business was operating. The second industrial revolution, we started to incorporate information. Information became much more valuable. It's what allowed us to really speed things up and give us a competitive advantage over those that weren't using the, uh, their information in the best possible way or the most effective way. Um, the collapsing information lag, historical developments in uh, electronic communications. Information used to take a long time to get from point A to point B. Pony Express, I mean, that was the, 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 the high speed of the time. And you put, put in a, a letter on a guy with a horse and you know, as fast as that horse can go, that's how fast the information moved. Telegraph helped to speed things up considerably, but still think about that. It's a point-to-point -point communication. Not everybody had telegraph. You usually had you know, one city or one town to another town. You still, for as an individual, you had to go to the telegraph office to, to send a message. To receive it, somebody from the telegraph office on the receiving end had to go tell that person or that person had to stop by the telegraph office. So even though the message itself might go from point A to point B relatively quickly, to get from the actual sender to the actual receiver, still could take quite a while. Uh, by the 1900s, or early 1900s, you start to see uh, introduction of radio. You st uh, start to see telephones. Um, you see telephones becoming much more widespread in terms of the, its use. So now all of a sudden, information is able to travel a little bit faster. It's able to disseminate a little bit faster. Obviously now, you can get virtually anywhere in the world in just a matter of seconds. Uh, three parts to understanding network. There's the concepts of networking, technologies, and the management of network. This book does a really, a, a, really a pretty good job of doing all three of those. It's probably a little thin when it comes to the management side of things. There's a few chapters that are devoted to some of those important issues. Things like uh, uh, security, and when we talk about security, we're not just talking about from hackers. We're talking about from data loss, hard drives failing, um, change management, accidental deletion of files, and things like that. So we'll talk a little bit about that later on in the, in the, in the text. But network design, managing a network, this book does a pretty good job of looking at those where a lot of texts avoid those issues. Uh, so I, I like this text in that respect. As far as the technologies, it talks about those at a relatively high level. You know, if you've never had a computer class before, um, I, I wouldn't stress too much, especially if you're fairly comfortable with uh, with using technology, using computers, things like that. Uh, it really talks at, um, about technology from a little higher level, uh, so more conceptual than, than application. And then it talks about, you know, obviously, the concepts. And we'll talk about that a little bit more here in a second when we get into some of the models. So. How does, you know, obviously we need the, the telecom industry, the telephone industry, to be able to, to take advantage of communications, to be able to you know, link our computers together and talk to computers on the other side of the world. So to really understand that, we have to have kind of an understanding of the telephone industry. Uh, 1876, the phone invent, uh, invented. 1915, uh, uh, first transcontinental and transatlantic phone connections. So now we're actually able to talk to people on another continent. In 1990, 1919, a switch is, a, is invented. There was actually a prediction long ago when, when uh, as telephones were starting to 
uh, become very prevalent, the growth of the, the telephone industry was such that it was predicted at one point that every woman in the United States would be a telephone operator. That's how fast the telephone system uh, was growing at one point. This helped to change all that. Instead of having to have a person sit there and physically make connections, you can automate a lot of that through the use of a switch. I didn't, not everybody went to the, the switches automatically. It took time for that to kind of work its way through the system. But it, it was the beginning of trying to automate some of these very routine, mundane, repetitive type tasks. And that's an important concept that we'll talk about a little bit more later, this idea of repetitive tasks. 1948, microwave trunk lines were used. Uh, if you're familiar with, with transmission uh, um, concepts at all, microwave is a point-to-point is -point protocol, so it allows you to, to transmit a signal from one point to another point. And, and that's great because it allows you to, to do this without the use of wires. You can do this wirelessly. Microwave works pretty well over a you know, fairly good distance, of, you know, depending on conditions and all that, 30 to 45 miles, something, something along those lines. Uh, so that was a pretty good breakthrough, especially in, in remote areas where it wasn't really feasible to run lines. Microwaves are great. But if you've got mountains in the way, you know, a lot of times satellites are, are a little bit nicer. Uh, send a signal a lot further around, around the globe uh, and can do it relatively quickly. 1969, uh, Picture Phone failed. Uh, uh, Picture Phone uh, was a company that first started using uh, video in phone, phone calls. Sounds like it's a long time ago, and it was. Um, and even though it failed, what it kind of signified was this idea of we can start to use some of these telecommunication systems for stuff other than just phone calls. For more than just data, we can use this to you know, video communications. It was really kind of a, a big deal. 76 packet switched data communications. Up until this point, all these were circuit switched. Anybody know what that means? It means once we open a circuit, we make that phone call, those switches create a single circuit. For the duration of that call, we're talking the same physical line that entire call. When we hang up, if we call back, we might get a different circuit. But for the duration of that call, it's one circuit. With packet switched, that changes. That means this particular second we might be going through one circuit. The next second it may be a different circuit. The next second it may be a different circuit. That's fine for a lot of types of communications. Like what? Pardon? The, the internet isn't Partly. packets. It is packet switched. Mm -hmm. But for things like email, web, that's great. Packet switch, no problems whatsoever. Why? Because it really doesn't matter about the different parts of an email message when they're being delivered. You know, if one packet shows up a little later than the other, as long as your software reassembles them in the proper order, everything's okay. When it comes to voice communications, though, that's a problem. A little bit of voice after or before another part of voice, conversation's completely different. So you can't really afford to do that. So there's certain things that occur in networking that allow you to kind of correct for that. But packet switching was really a big deal because it allowed you to more efficiently move data from point A to point B as circuits came online and failed. We'll talk about that a little more in a second, too. Uh, and then mid-80s, cellular telephones started becoming more prevalent. A lot of this was hampered and helped by various forms of regulation. Uh, so, back in the early 1900s, we had all kinds of stuff, uh, all kinds of things going on. The phone invented in 1876, 85, things started really developing very quickly, AT&T uh, uh, forms. By 1900, so within the period of 24 years, you end up with millions of phones in the U.S. So it's really pretty quickly evolving uh, um, form of communication. By 1910, you have a Bell System de facto monopoly. It means basically they control everything. Uh, basically what it was is AT&T was offering telephone services. Bell, as part of that company, uh, was producing all of the hardware. And this basically was in effect for a number of years. We'll talk, we'll talk about here in just a little bit. Um, it was a monopoly. You could not compete with AT&T. You could not offer 
long distance services. You could not plug any other type of hardware, anything that was not Bell, into the phone jack. You couldn't use somebody else's phone. Um, so that uh, uh, was something that, that changes here shortly. Uh, in 1910, you start to see the regulation of some of these. It starts out by a, 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 an entity called the ICC that changes into the FCC in 1934 with broader regulatory powers. In 68, the Carafone court decision allowing non-Bell equipment, basically, to be plugged up to, to the, the phone system. That was a big deal. Now, all of a sudden, you start to see more competition. What happens with increased competition? Drop. Pardon? Prices drop. Prices drop. Usually, hopefully, the idea is prices drop, services increase. You get better service. Why? Because everybody's competing against each other. Everybody's got to do better than the next guy. That's the idea. Sometimes it works that way, sometimes it doesn't, but, but that's the concept. Um, actually, let me go back there. Um, in 1970, MCI wins a court case to begin providing some long distance services. So now they're getting it at two ends. On the hardware side of things, there's competition. And on the phone services side of things, there's competition. In 1984, AT&T gets broken up. So now AT&T becomes a variety of different companies. Uh, and we'll come back to some of this here in just a second. But in 96, you end up with the US Telecom Act. They basically scrap all this regulation that's been occurring and replace it with uh, their own brand of regulation, if you will. Essentially, it's uh, the deregulation of the telecom industry designed to uh, increase competition uh, to a large degree. Uh, so the 84 consent decree, the vestiture of the regional bells. So AT&T is broken up into one long distance company, which is still the AT&T that we see today, and then seven regional bell operating companies. So now what you essentially have is Anybody can make hardware and plug it up to the telephone system. AT&T by themselves offers long distance services with respect to this breakup. Again, there's competitors. There's MCI, Sprint, etc. And then as far as local service, you've got the seven baby bells, regional bells. Bell Atlantic, 9X, Bell South, Ameritech, etc. Deregulation continued. You end up with competitive long distance uh, market where MCI Sprint entered the market because that was part of that lawsuit. But at the local level, these regional bells are still a virtual monopoly, monopoly in the, in the, within their regions. In other words, US West has a region that's assigned to them. They can't compete against Southwestern Bell. They're limited to their regions. That's part of what that uh, uh, deregulation in 1996 was designed to get rid of so that they it forced those baby bells to become more competitive, to compete against each other. Uh, so 96, it replaced all current laws, FCC regulations, all of that stuff uh, with their own, own deregulatory st uh, uh, stances. Main goal, open local markets to competition. I don't know that I totally agree with the text uh, on this next part where it says to date, though, uh, the local and long distance competition is slow to take hold. Maybe it was slow initially. But I think to a large degree, you have to look at it and say, I think it's been pretty successful. There's a reason everybody has a cell phone. Um, there, I mean, everybody has a cell phone. So uh, I, I really think competition is, is doing really pretty well uh, uh, with respect to long distance as well as local services. Uh, worldwide competitive markets as far as the Internet market. Extremely competitive with more than 5,000 internet service providers in the U.S. alone. There's lots and lots of you know, ISPs. What we were talking about earlier as far as competition, I, I usually increased competition I think is a good thing. But with 5,000 ISPs, that, that may be too many. I mean, really? How, ma how many can you really have? I think when, once you get to that point, um, that you've got a lot of redundancy that's going on. And, and they may not be as competitive as they could be with fewer necessarily. Uh, heavy competition in this area may lead to a shakeout in the near future. Again, with that many competitors, a lot of those are going to be smaller market ones. What does that mean? It means the larger market ones are probably going to end up buying them out eventually. Some of this worldwide competition is spurred on by the World Trade Organization trying to develop policies and get various countries on board with uh, 
try to provide internet services to, you know, to, to their citizen, uh, citizenry. Uh, the idea being that you know, access to the internet can help you in, in, in countless ways. It can help you deliver uh, financial services, health services, uh, educational services, things that will really help you know, countries in, in, in all kinds of ways that, that we really can't attempt, really can't calculate. Um, multinational telecom companies, we're starting to see more and more competition from European countries into the United States, and United States companies into other countries. So uh, the competition that we used to really focus on with respect to AT&T, Sprint, MCI, et cetera, that's kind of small, small scale looking into the future in some of these companies that, that uh, are going to be competing head to head globally. So all this talk about the history of, of, of telecom, the history of, uh, of computers, uh, that type of stuff, that's what allows us to look at the history of information systems, or to look at information systems and identify where we are now, why we are where we are, things like that. So if you keep some of those timelines in mind that we, we've already talked about, we can start to talk about this, and then things start to mesh and start to make sense, hopefully. Any questions so far? Okay. So batch processing mainframes start really in, in, in the, the mid-50s or early 50s. We started out with, uh, at the end of World War II, a lot of focus by the Department of Defense on looking at mainframes. This is where you end up with, with the, uh, the, uh, the quote from the CEO of IBM way back in the day of saying he could see the need for about five computers in the world. Well, I mean, there's five times that in this room. So uh, so by the mid-50s, you start to see organizations, corporations, to say, you know what, we could use some of that processing power. These computers could allow us to do certain things much more efficiently, much more effectively than we can do manually. So batch processing system. When we're talking about batch processing, what are we talking about? Give me an example. maybe have different content. It's a different name, claimant. It's a different policy number. It's a different amount. It's the same form over and over again. Doctor's offices, um, payroll, inventory. Same forms, but it's the same thing over and over again. Different numbers, but the same form. So batch processing, when we process these, these, these paychecks or these claims, you know, a lot of them all at once, rather than having to pay a department to sit there and have all these people do it manually. So batch processing systems were very well suited for, for mainframes, uh, for early mainframes. In the early to mid-60s, data communications over phone lines started to become much more prevalent. Tele most telecommunication costs, we start to see some of that deregulation that we were talking about. That's what's allowing this. Now all of a sudden we have access to the telecom system. We can plug up different hardware to it. We can now more cheaply transmit data across the telecom network. Uh, early 70s, that deregulation's continued. We can now start to, instead of doing batch processing across tele telecom lines, now we can start to do some real-time stuff. Speeds aren't that great. So you, if you're Walmart, you're not transmitting all that data that you have from you know, every hour of sales at the store. No, back then, they couldn't handle that kind of data. But at the same time, for important things, you could put stuff online and have a real-time exchange of information, real-time time exchange of data. Uh, August 12, 1981. I remember August 12 because it's the day my son was born, uh, but not in 81. Uh, 81, PC revolution. IBM PCs launched, and that was really kind of a big change. Uh, it, it took computers from being limited to, it took mainframes from being limited to a PC or, or computing technology from being limited to either hobbyists or large corporations and really kind of allowed everybody, small businesses as well, to have access to, at least on, on some scale, to, to computing technology. Uh, Mid-90s, PC LANs become common. Why? 1995, Microsoft releases Windows 95. Even though it was kind of something that, um, it was kind of borrowing, stealing, mimicking, whatever you want to say, uh, some of the Apple stuff, what was the big difference between the two? 
IBM had market share or the PC had market share. So now instead of 5% of the market having having a, a, a GUI or a graphical user interface, now the other 95% had a graphical user interface. So now all of a sudden it became easy to use. So you end up with a real boom uh, with respect to LANs. And now you look at, at networking everywhere. I mean, I, I drive out in the middle of nowhere and I still have access uh, to, to the internet on my phone. So uh, you're always connected. So some of the milestones in the internet uh, internet history. Originally, the internet when it was originally formed was formed it was, it was referred to as ARPANET, and it was a development project by the Department of Defense. And depending on on what you're reading, as far as some of the ideas behind it, essentially what was happening was they were trying to develop a proof of concept that they could have a network that could be resilient, that part of the network could go down and communications could continue. Now. Some of the sources you might read might say that uh, this was was because of fear of a, of a nuclear strike from the Soviets um, back during that time period. Um, best I can tell, that that's kind of a rumor at, at best. Uh, the real issue actually had to do with the technology that was being used. Switches were not that good back back then. They they failed at a really high rate, and as a result, you you, you wanted to allow those switches to be able to fail yet still have the network to continue to run. That's what we were talking about earlier when we said packet switching. We can have that switch fail, and now the next packet, instead of taking that particular route, it takes a different route. So it's able to, to work its way around up a failed switch. Um, 1983, ARPANET splits into two parts. MILNET for military purposes, and the Internet. The, internet, the precursor to what we would think of as the Internet today. Um, Essentially, initially it was designed for academic and educational research purposes. So it was, it was designed to uh, help professors and research institutions collaborate and work on various projects together to solve, solve problems. Uh, and, and that's really what it was designed to do. In uh, 86, the NSF net was created as the U.S. Internet backbone, essentially an upgrade, uh, trying to increase speed. In 1990, Quasi-commercial access to the internet began. It was really kind of the beginning of the end as far as the traditional internet uh, was originally conceived, originally designed. Once they started to allow commercial access to it by uh, CompuServe, uh, which was posting financial information online, uh, which they were able to do under the guise that it was basically for research purposes, but the reality was is it had commercial value. And once that started, it was kind of the, the snowball that, that took effect. And eventually, uh, it got to where government funding um, was stopped because it became a viable entity in and of itself. Uh, today, I mean, there's just, there, I mean, there's over a billion users. You look at the U.S., and I think they're pushing 90% market penetration. And that's not the highest. I mean, there's a lot of countries. You look at uh, South Korea, very, very high market penetration. Uh, in South Korea, so there's a lot of countries where everybody's connected. Um, the book talks a little bit about the, the, the marriage of telecommunications and data communications. I don't know that this is a particularly valuable uh, point, but you know, we recognize that sometimes when you're talking to somebody, if they say telecom, they may be talking about datacom. If you're talking to somebody and they say datacom, they may be talking about telecom. It's really a pretty subtle distinction. Usually you're talking about some kind of voice communication, and usually you're talking about some kind of data communication, you know, an email or, or something like that. Um, but the reality is that you're seeing a huge convergence between the two. How many of you Skype? I Skype pretty regularly. My wife and I, when we first started talking, uh, the first year I was in, in Pennsylvania as a professor, uh, for a period of a year I think we spent like 5,000 hours online is what we calculated. So, you can spend a lot of time online, but that's a, a convergence of data communications and telecommunications. Um, so at this point, we're going to start to talk a little bit about some of the networks, some of the designs and stuff like that. Again, it's a really high level at this point. I want to introduce you to some of the terms. You probably you might be familiar with some of the terms, but I want to talk about it for just a little bit. In a really simple network, uh, a local area network, we're really talking about geographic scope, so how large of a, of a space is it. It depends on the text that you're reading. Some of them will define it different ways. Some of them will tell you so many feet of each other that a computer 
is to another computer. Okay, that's a LAN. Uh, some will say within a building. Some will say uh, if you have rights to run the wires, you don't have to get a, a permit from a city or anything like that, then that's a, a, a LAN. There's a lot of different definitions of LANs and WANs and MANs and all those types of things. So don't get hung up on them too much. But in general, you ought to be able to look at some of these designs and say, okay, that's a local area network or that's a metropolitan area network, things like that. So at its simplest, with, with, a, with a local area network, we might have client computers. What's a client computer? What does a client do? It's just one user. It's a user. The client requests something. It's using something. Um, you get on the internet, you, you bring up a browser, you're using a web page. You're requesting a web page from a server, from a web server. So the web server is serving up that web page to the client. Your circuits have to connect them somehow. Your circuit may be uh, 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 some kind of wire, like shielded twisted pair or, or uh, unshielded twisted pair, so usually UTP or uh, STP. Uh, it can be fiber optic, it can be wireless, but it's still referred to as a circuit. You're going to have to have some kind of connecting device, something that allows those signals to distribute. So it, in the early days of, of, of networking, it, that traditionally would have been a hub. Hubs, which we'll talk about a little bit later in the semester, aren't particularly efficient. You really don't see hubs used, used anymore. For the most part, you can see switches. Hubs and switches work just fine for your local segment, which is what this would be referred to right here. Your local segment, so all the computers that are in the local area. If you want to talk to something that's outside of your local area or some other type of network, you've got to have a router. And that's what a router uh, 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 performs as far as the function. A router is what's going to allow you to get out on the internet, for example. Um, so as far as looking at different types of networks based on scale, local area networks, they're going to define it as a room, a building, a group of PCs that share a circuit. So I mean, some people might call all the computers in this building as part of a single local area network, and they wouldn't be wrong. Some people, somebody might argue just these computers in this room, and they wouldn't be wrong. Um, this one really doesn't fit in here, but I'll, I'll talk about it just briefly since it's there. A backbone network is really just a high-speed network that's designed to link to get together various other local area networks. Uh, so that if you happen to have a segment that needs to send a message to a computer that's on another segment, you can do that quickly and efficiently. Metropolitan area networks are larger in scale than a LAN. Metropolitan should be the dead giveaway, usually about the size of a city. Maybe it links together a few cities. Anybody live in Granbury? Granbury has a small metropolitan area network. Uh, basically what they do is they provide services to their citizens. So you've got basic internet access uh, where you can only access certain things, city functions and things like that. Uh, and then for a paid fee, you can have uh, access to, to the internet at large. Uh, it's something that they offer, offer their, their citizens. Um, there are cities all across the country, really throughout the world, that, that uh, uh, do that. Some places it's hard to find, some places it's not. Wide area networks are the largest in scope. There's one really good example of a, of a WAN. The internet. It's the, there's an internet and then there's the internet. An internet is just a network of networks. That's what the internet is. When we talk about the internet, we're talking about the one that we access all the time and, and things of that nature. There's other um, types of networks as well that they don't talk about in the book. There's personal area networks. Uh, which are Bluetooth devices, really short distance type things. Um, let's see, there's some of the other types of networks. Uh, bands, bands, bands. There's other types as well, but I'm escaping my mind right now. So there's kind of some uh, diagram type uh, um, examples of what we're talking about. So when we talk about a local area network, we're really talking about something in a relatively small space. Again. One way of looking at it is that if you can run the wires without having to get any kind of a, a, a permit or anything like that, you know, you're running it across the street, you got to get a permit for that. Uh, but if you don't have to get a permit, it's probably on a, a pretty small scale. Uh, campus area network, that's, that's the other example I was thinking of. Uh, backbone network, again, you've got multiple networks, maybe one at a fire station, one at a flight building, main gate. So you might have different local area networks 
and you want to tie them together with some kind of a high-speed backbone network so that if you had to send a message from the fire station to a hangar, you, you can. A metropolitan area network, larger in scope, it might be different locations throughout a city, and then ultimately something on the internet might span the entire country, continent, and then the globe. Now, obviously, the, the definitions are up there, but what's the difference between the intranet, extranet, and the internet? The more you use the terms, the more familiar you'll be, the more comfortable you'll be with them. Okay, I'll try with the first one. The intranet is within your, like, within your business. You can have internet, and no, no, other, other users can't access it. Yep. Uh, whereas the internet... A lot of people can ask, but I don't know about the extranet. Basically, the, the key concept is they're all based on the same technology. That's the really key thing. They all use web servers. They all use web browsers. Why is that important? Because everybody knows how to use a web browser. They, you've got your favorite, Firefox or Opera or Internet Explorer. But everybody knows how to use a web browser. The uh, uh, web servers, you know, as far as the people on the back end, they know how to configure those, set those up, so everybody can use those. The differences are, are what you were just saying. Uh, Internet's open for everybody. Internet's limited to people within the organization. Maybe you want to share your uh, uh, HR information with your employees as an organization. Obviously, you don't want outsiders looking at people's social security numbers and benefits and things like that. But that's a benefit to be able to share with your users you know, that they can easily access online through a web browser. And that, that's a great thing about using Internet technologies. As far as an extranet, Maybe you want to open up your, your, your web server up to outside entities, but you don't want to open up to everybody. Maybe you've got an organization that uh, doesn't want to keep track of inventory. They outsource their inventory. They allow their suppliers to log into their own systems, look at their inventory levels, and then deliver stuff that you're low on. Why? It kind of shifts some of these burden to them. Instead of you having to track your inventory, your supplier's doing it for you. You see that a lot in grocery stores a lot of times, where suppliers are looking at the stock on the shelves, and if it needs to be restocked, they stock it themselves. So, uh, just an example of each of those types of things. Uh, layered implementations of communication functions. Um, we tend to think of a single layer. We just think we hit a web browser and it works, right? You type in an address and everything just, it, it works. But the reality is, is from a, a, a troubleshooting perspective, from an application development uh, uh, perspective, we really need to start to think about things from a layered approach, breaking up the, the, the way communications works into different discrete layers so that if there's a problem, we don't have to tackle the entire problem, we just have to tackle the individual part that actually has the problem, or is actually causing the problem. Uh, Multi-layered uh, network models. They talk about two most important such network models as the OSI and the Internet model. There's a third one out there that's pretty popular called the DOD model, Department of Defense. And they're all very similar. There, there's a, a lot of similarity between them, and we'll talk about those similarities in the next few slides. Um, the oldest one, the most widely used one, is the OSI model by the uh, uh, ISO. So don't get those two confused. <laughs> ISO is the organization. OSI is the model itself. Um, it's been around a long time. That's why it's been so widely used. Uh, it's not particularly popular anymore because it's, it's kind of overly complex, overly, uh, at least parts of it are. Uh, so we'll talk about that here in just a second. The Internet model, created by DARPA in the early 70s, developed to solve the problems of Internet working. And instead of having seven layers, it's only got five. And all, the only way it does that is by combining the top three layers of the OSI model. Uh, and it's based on the TCPIP protocol suite. So, if we look at the seven-layer model, they kind of give you an acronym there, uh, uh, PDNTSPA. So please do, uh, please do not touch these pet alligators or backwards. All people seem to need data, uh, network data processing. Um, so really, we're going to focus on these three layers as a single layer because when we use a system, for the most part, that's how it works. When you open up a web browser, that's not what we're talking about when we say application. What we're talking about is the protocol that's used by that web browser. What's that protocol? It's HTTP. Yeah. So as opposed to an FTP client. or you know, So it's the protocol at the application layer, layer that we're talking about. 
Well, the reality is, is that browser also performs presentation layer functions in terms of data compression, things like that. Formatting things that are on the screen, where images load, where the text loads, things like that. And then the session layer takes care of our various sessions, some of our security. But SSL, those certificates for our secure uh, communications that our browser uses with the web, uh, web server. So a lot of that all occurs through the use of our browser or our FTP client or, or whatever application we happen to be using. So that's why we tend to combine those three, and you'll see that in the other models. These are really where a lot of the other, the, a lot of the work that you really want to know more about uh, occurs. The transport layer deals with end-to-end -end issues such as segmenting the message for, for network transport. When we send a message across the network, it doesn't just send a file. I mean, if we have a 10 meg file, it doesn't send that 10 meg, 10 meg file as a 10 meg file. It breaks it up into smaller chunks and sends them out chunk by chunk by chunk. And that's the, the, the function of the transport layer is to break those chunks up and number them appropriately so that when they're received on the receiving end, they can be reassembled in the right order and put back together. The network layer is responsible for getting all of those chunks to the destination. Now those chunks may not all take the same route. That's what we were talking about earlier in packet switching. Those chunks may take different routes and that's the job of the network layer to take care of, of those different routes and make sure that those packets get from point A to point B. The data link layer deals with message delineation on the local area network. So we're talking about Ethernet or token ring, something like that. And then lastly, the physical layer, the physical specifications for our connectivity. So things like the wires, how, what types of wires are appropriate, uh, the types of, of, of plugs that we use, the uh, pinouts of those wires, so where the wires are supposed to be inside of that plug. That's what the physical layer is all about. And all of this is works based on standards. If we don't have standards, none of this none of this works. And we'll come back to that that here in just a second. The internet uh, internet's five layer model is a little bit more streamlined. Why? Because it just it collapses those first three uh, those first three functions, those first three layers. Binds them all into the application layer. Why? Because most applications, most software applications, take care of all those application functions. Um, transport layer essentially the same, same responsibilities, same responsibilities at, at the other levels. Essentially, they do the same things. Uh, so, kind of gives you this uh, uh, graphic. Kind of gives you a, an example of the OSI model up against the Internet model, so you can kind of see them how they translate uh, uh, directly. And then it kind of gives you some examples of what's going on. Again, those first three, Internet Explorer, your FTP client, um, some of the other types of clients that, that you can use, uh, your TCP IP software, and then at your local area, uh, or local level, Ethernet ports, the cables, and stuff like that. Now, I mentioned there was one other model. There's the DOD model, which is essentially the same as this, except it's uh, four layers. And the only difference is it combines the data link layer and the physical layer together. Again, because much like this application layer, it's really hard to separate usually your, your network card. If you have an Ethernet card, the physical connectivity is usually, you know, you're pretty limited in what you can do. So it makes a lot of sense to combine those two as well. So usually if you're thinking about those, those layers, uh, uh, the application layer, the transport layer, the network layer, and then these two together, for the most part, can usually determine where the problem is occurring from a troubleshooting perspective. Any questions so far? We good? I'm not trying to rush through it. I want you to throw something at me if, if I say something doesn't make sense. Um, so how does a message actually get, go from point A to point B? We type in a message into the, the Internet Explorer and it starts to go through this whole process. We've got a sender and a receiver. Now on the sending side, we open up the web browser and we type in an address and we hit enter. What happens when we hit enter? Well, at that application layer up there, it starts to, and I really don't like this graphic because it's got a lot of this click stuff and there's a better example here in a little bit. But what happens is that application layer address gets encapsulated, which gets encapsulated, which gets encapsulated, all the way down until we get to the physical layer. And then it comes back over here and it starts to decapsulate or pull those smaller pieces back out, all the way back out over here. 
So if we put in that address for a web address, it goes all the way down, comes back over here, it unpackages it, and the web server over here says, oh, you want this address. Then the whole process starts in reverse to send that web page back to the other side. So I'm going to go through this real quick and get to that next one, because I think that other one is a little bit more... Not this one, but the next one. Okay, so all this functions on protocols. What is a protocol? Set of rules. It's rules. It's, it says that you know, when you greet each other, you say hello. When you, you know, depart, you say goodbye. You shake hands. You, you Certain courtesies, just like a, a standard conversation. The difference is, is, as opposed to a verbal conversation that we might have with others, when we're talking about computer protocols, they're very structured. You can't afford to you know, miss a bit here or miss a bit there. Um, there are, are, are actually protocols that if a bit goes missing, how to fix that, how to replace that bit, how to, to resend a communication. And that's what a protocol is designed to do. It's a protocol that makes those layers work. Without a protocol, we don't have any kind of mechanism for sending that message from that application layer down to the TCP level, down to the IP level. We have to have a protocol for, to be able to do that. So this is the, the one I was talking about. So we have this application uh, layer where we type in www.microsoft.com. It gets encapsulated, not just the it, it gets encapsulated in an HTTP request. When we send it down to the transport layer, we encapsulate not only the original request, but also the header to the HTTP request into a TCP IP or excuse me TCP segment. When we send that TCP segment down to the network layer, again, we encapsulate not only that request, the HTTP header, the TCP segment header, but also the IP header. Now we've got it, we've assigned it an IP address. And we continue that process all the way down until ultimately we convert that to ones and zeros that we send across a wire, that we send in light signals, that we send across radio signals, however we're going to get it from the sender side to the receiving side. On that receiving side, it does everything in reverse. It strips off that Ethernet frame. It strips off that IP address. It strips off that the TCP segment uh, header. It strips off the HTTP, HTTP request, and the web server says, oh, you want this page. That's as simple as it gets. Um, so points about the network layer view. Layers allow simplicity of networking in some ways. So if you go back over here and you write applications, you write, you create a, a web browser. That's what you're doing. You're an application programmer and you create web browsers. What do you, what, do you care about any of this stuff? You don't have to. There are protocols in place and there are standards in place that say we don't have to. These are all going to take care of themselves. As somebody who's writing an application, the only thing we have to do is make sure that we're following the protocols and standards to be able to communicate with the transport layer. If we can communicate with the transport layer, everything else takes care of itself. Same thing down here at the physical layer. If you're um, 3Com, for example, you make networking equipment. You don't care about application stuff. All you care about the pro are the protocols and the standards that are in place so that you can talk about, well, it, it, actually, probably I'll break it here, so that you can communicate with the network layer. That's all you care about. You don't have to deal with those application programmers. So it really allows different groups within the, the field of, uh, of data communications to be able to work on their problems in isolation and yet still be assured that, that things are going to work together. Uh, matching layers communicate uh, between different computers and computer platforms. So back in the early days of computing, we had a real issue. We had PCs, and they were king, right? Because IBM said so. They were big in business, we, you know, so there were a lot of business applications for them. But they weren't very computer friendly. Everybody's using DOS. Everybody, DOS? I mean, not a lot of fun. Um, so it was a real pain. And then there's all these, these the, the, the geeks that were using a lot of Apple stuff. And then the real weird people are using Linux stuff. And so we've got all these different systems, and they don't talk. You take a disk from one and go to another one, it didn't work. These different layers, by having these various standards and these different layers and these different protocols, we're, we can now take a Windows box. You can receive a web page from an Apache server on a Linux box. 
and you can see that page just fine. There may be some subtle formatting differences and things like that, but for the most part, you can share information back and forth from different platforms. Why? Because they speak the same language. They use the same protocols. The downside is, is it's pretty inefficient. Think about all that encapsulation that was going on. We encapsulate a message, we encapsulate it, we encapsulate it, we get to the other side, we decapsulate, decapsulate, decapsulate. That's a lot of processing, it takes a lot of time. We have to do that every time we send a request. So you open up a web page, it's not just the web page that is doing that for, it's doing that for all the images on that web page. If there's music, it's doing it for that. All those various things that load up on a web page, it's doing those requests back and forth, all that encapsulation back and forth. So there's a lot of processing time that gets tied up in that. But that's the sacrifice that we make, that's the, the, the trade-off of being able to make sure that we have good, reliable communications from one, one system that's not normally compatible with another system. We have to have all those, those various uh, steps. So it is somewhat inefficient. But it works because of standards. It's important because it provides a fixed way for hardware and or software systems to communicate. They speak that same language. Types of standards, we've got formal standards and we've got de facto standards. Formal standards, we've got various um, bodies that develop standards, they get together, they talk about things, they send out requests for proposals, requests for comments, and they get feedback from people in the industry. Those people in the industry may be Microsoft, they may be uh, independent parties, Tim Berners-Lee, um, for a variety of different companies and, and, and regulatory bodies and nations uh, that might have some kind of comment, might have some kind of interest in what a, a particular standard is. Uh, and so they can all talk about that and you end up developing formal standards that way. Uh, it's a very lengthy process, takes a long time, sometimes you end up with organizations that disagree, but uh, it, it's, it's a, something that has worked and for the most part done a pretty good job of, of making sure we have a, a lot of interoperability between different systems. You also end up with de facto standards. I want to anybody uh, explain what a de facto standard is? It's usually something that comes from a pretty large organization, um, or it could be a small organization that, that hits the market much earlier than, than any of their competitors, and they create a foothold. It hasn't gone through a formal standardization process, but they develop some, uh, uh, such a following, such a user base, that everybody kind of has to follow suit because they've set the pace, they've set the standard, the de facto standard, so to speak. And that does happen from time to time. You see, for example, uh, in wireless networking, you had 802.11n, uh, which is, is, is the latest uh, incarnation of our, our um, uh, consumer wireless networking. Uh, and you ended up, as some of these standardization bodies were working on the standards, trying to hammer it out. Remember I said you ended up with a, 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 you ended up with a, a, a large lag time between Proposing it and actually adopting a formal standard, you ended up with a lot of companies that went out went out ahead of time, went out early, and were already selling 802.11n compatible devices. Well, how is that possible? There weren't formal standards created, right? Well, they end up basically making a guess uh, and trying to dominate the market by if they can get enough of their units out there, enough consumers using their units, then they can hopefully influence the standards making bodies to adopt their standards. And it's happened before with respect to modems uh, and things like that. So it does happen. Uh, standardization process, you've got the, the issue of a specification, identif identifying your various choices, and then ultimately accepting. That's just kind of a bird's eye level view of how the process works. Specifications of saying we want to be able to communicate with video and voice, well that means that your network has to be able to prioritize packets. That it can say this packet's a voice communication, the next packet is also a voice communication, those two have to be together. We can't split those up. This one that's an email, if they get an email five seconds later, it's not gonna hurt. But if we get voice communications five seconds later, it, it messes up the message. So that's a, a it might be a specification that gets uh, listed by people working on a particular standard. Once we've got all those specifications, we can look at all our various choices, various proposals from different groups. Uh, we can look at those choices and try to identify the one that we actually want, and then hopefully end up with acceptance where 
everybody agrees on one and produces that particular product or products that meet that particular standard. Some of those standards making bodies, some of them are domestic to the U.S., some of them are international. Um, I remember back in the, the early to mid 90s, my sister was a foreign exchange student in Germany, and it, it was it was funny because you're just starting to see the internet, the commercialized uh, internet, start to really pop up around the world. And there's this. I remember coming back and talking about having arguments with people about that the internet wasn't invented in, in the U.S. And, and oh yes, it's invented in the U.S. The reality is, is the the infrastructure for the internet or for the internet was the World Wide Web though to a large degree was Tim Berners Lee European. It's really kind of a global phenomenon, so that's why you end up with a lot of of, of uh, standards making bodies that are all around the world because it really is kind of a global effort. So the ISO, technical recommendations for data communication interfaces, uh, lots of standards making bodies within uh, various nations that work on, uh, work together in the, in, the, in the ISO. You end up with the ITUT, uh, technical recommendations about telephone, telegraph, data communications. Again, when we talk about computers, it's not just computers, it's part of the telecom industry. They have to work with AT&T and MCI. And so it's, it's not just a case of computers, it's a case of, of all these various technologies that have to interface and work together. Uh, ANSI here in the United States, uh, coordinating organization for us, they're not really a standards making body, though they do um, publish a lot of the standards that we have, have in this country. Uh, the IEEE, the IETF develops internet standards. Uh, let's see. So some of this data com uh, uh, standards and how they relate to the internet model. So when we talk about the HTTP at the application layer, that's a standard. It's a standard protocol for that. If we were going to create an application, we would have to, if we wanted it to be able to work using HTTP, we'd have to look up that protocol and make sure that our application could communicate using HTTP. At uh, the transport layer, we want to make sure that we, we can use TCP if we're talking about the internet. Now, if we're talking about Novell servers and things like that, SPX is their equivalent. Novell servers anymore use TCP2, so it's not, not really an issue anymore. Uh, at the network layer, we want to make sure it uses IP. Uh, again, IPX is for Novell. Data link layer, we want to look up the Ethernet standards, most likely, at least if we're talking about a local area network. Uh, we're talking about WANs and things like that. We might be more interested in frame relay standards and, and things like that. But... Uh, we have to look up those standards so we can make sure that our uh, our physical devices, our network cards, our cabling, all works with those standards. And then the physical layer, again, like Twisted Pair, for example, that we're producing the plugs that will fit the jacks that we're actually trying to plug things into. Emerging twins, uh, trends in networking. Pervasive networking, which is what it sounds like, pervasive, and we'll talk about that here in just a second. Integration of voice, video, and data, and then new information services. The internet really kind of changed a lot of the offerings that you can you can get. Uh, so when we talk about uh, pervasive networking, it's that it's everywhere. I mean, it, it is everywhere. You go down to the Coke machine, you can just wipe your credit card in anymore. You don't have to be looking for quarters. Uh, so you're connected to a network somehow. It's got to process that transaction. Um, again, I can be between here and, and nowhere and, and still get internet on my phone. So there's all types of devices. Um, that, that are allowing access. That's part of the reason when you talk about exponential growth for data rates for all kinds of networking. Um, anybody heard of IPv6, uh, uh, Internet Protocol version 6? We're going from 4 to 6. Why? We we're running out of addresses from 4. And that was like 4.5 billion addresses or something like that. I mean, it's a massive amount of addresses in, in IP, uh, Internet Protocol version 6 four number of addresses that were possible. Every device that connects to the network, to the internet, has a unique IP address. We were running out of that. Why? Because we plug everything up to the internet. Coke machines, coffee machines, everything on the internet. So we're running out of that. That's why we have, have IP version 6 coming out, which we'll talk about a little bit more later in the semester. But it's because because we're hooking everything up, that we need those additional addresses. It's that exponential growth. It's that idea that everything needs to be connected because information is power. Information is knowledge. Information is is convenience. It's, it's being able to 
play your game in the middle of the night and, and things like that. Uh, and then broadband communications really help to facilitate that. You can't do this on dial-up. You're not watching Netflix on dial-up. It's just not going to happen. So between having all these various things, all these things coming together, networking is all around us. You're constantly uh, uh, using the network in some fashion. Now, I'm not really going to go through that, but it's kind of an interesting thing. If you want to take a look at it, it kind of gives you a, 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 a concept of the growth of, of uh, data rates and things like that on networks. Uh, another big issue is the integration of voice data and, and uh, voice video and data. That's what I was asking earlier, people that are on Skype. Everybody expects to be able to watch Netflix, to be able to get on Skype, to be able to do all kinds of things. Not just do that, but do other things while you're Skyping at the same time. So we really expect that type of integration to occur, that type of, of uh, integration uh, to, to link all these various things together and be able to use those functions. And, and we expect it, we demand it, and it, it's what's really allowing us to uh, 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 computers to really kind of move into our everyday life of being not just a tool for business, but a tool for entertainment, a tool for uh, communication, really something that's, just, like I said, part of our everyday life. And then new information services, things like uh, um, being able to access your financial services online, being able to, I saw a commercial the other day for a tax service, uh, H&R Block, I think it was, where instead of going to an H&R Block office, Instead of just doing it online, you can actually get online and, and uh, with a video chat with a tax professional. So now it's not just doing it online, the convenience of doing it from your own home. You've actually got professional advice from somebody that's right there that you're talking with. Um, some people wouldn't be interested in that, but, but other people would. Uh, you don't have to go to an office, so that's, that's convenient. You don't have to feel like you're putting stuff in the wrong fields or anything like that because, again, you've got a professional right there to help you with. Uh, other types of... of Information services, think about, blog, think about bloggers. The last election cycle, bloggers had an impact on you know, a lot of the stories that were being broken. So you have content providers, individuals from their homes that are typing, uh, typing about things and writing about things. Uh, you've got individuals that write reviews about books that they purchased or movie, movies that they've seen. So you've seen information services that didn't exist before in terms of individuals uh, uh, participating, being content providers. Um, one of the things I like about this book is that it finishes up each chapter talking about implications for management, which is, I think, are particularly useful because it kind of gives you a, a practical side of things, an application side of things. Uh, and, and some of the implications that they identified, embrace change is act, and actively seek to use new aspects of networks towards improving your organization. It means it's not going to do you any good to stick your head in the sand. When you use you need to be proactive and paying attention to trade publications and things of that nature to see when new, new trends are coming down the line, to see if there's a new protocol that's coming out that will address some kind of an issue or a new piece of hardware, uh, a new standard, things of that nature. And when it's appropriate, adopt it. Don't be afraid to adopt it. At the same time, you don't want to be a, you know, somebody that jumps out there So because you run the risk of you know, that, that standard not going through or that particular you know, device not working with some of your other stuff. But you need to be proactive and pay attention to some of the things that are going on in the market. Uh, use a set of industry standard technologies. Again, don't be that first one out there to buy the latest and greatest. Why? Because they, they, don't, they possibly don't pay attention to standards or they're not necessarily as, as diligent in writing their protocols or writing their applications to comply with, with uh, uh, particular standards. So you, you want to stay with standard standard equipment for the most part. You don't want to buy exotic pieces of equipment, exotic uh, uh, PCs, things like that. If you do, what happens? You drive up the cost, your maintenance costs go up, it can be kind of a nightmare in terms of, of managing your network. That is pretty much it for that chapter. Uh, any questions over, over the chapter?